Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Dean Marsh, Managing Director, North America. So thanks very much for being here with us this morning in Boston. We're here for science. I've been blinded by science. I waited all year to say that. <laughs> but thank you. Um, I'm Dean Marsh. I'm the managing director for Dassault System here in North America. And that means I'm responsible for our go-to-market activities in United States, Canada, and Mexico. And I'm very pleased to welcome you here uh, to the science event. I am located here in our North American headquarters, which is just down the Mass Pike in Waltham. So this is uh, probably the shortest commute to an event I've had uh, all year. And uh, it's been a great year. I've been at Dassault System now for almost uh, a year. It's been a fantastic year. And uh, the science event is very special and important because uh, in my heart, I'm still a scientist. Uh, we said science is material. And uh, by education, I am a material scientist. So I get really excited when I see additive manufacturing of exotic materials like titanium and inconel and, and other alloys and uh, you know composite materials that we'll hear about uh, it, it just brings out the geek in me uh, but we also said science is about discovery and I think our next speaker Dr. Michael Rosbash really is going to give you a compelling story about discovery I think there is no higher um, recognition of a, the importance of discovery than the Nobel Prize. So it is my distinct honor and pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Michael Rosbash. Uh, Dr. Rosbash earned his PhD in biophysics from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, right across the river from us. And he is now a professor of biology and he is the Peter Gruber Professor of Neuroscience at Brandeis University. He has been an investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute since 1989. Dr. Ross Bash, along with his colleagues Jeffrey Hall and Michael Young, won the 2017 Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine for their discoveries around the molecular mechanisms for controlling the circadian rhythm. So without further ado, I'd like to invite Dr. Michael Rosbash, Nobel Laureate, to the stage. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Bonjour à tout le monde. Let's see if this will work. Good, we're all set. So uh, I, I, I should have entitled I should have entitled this talk uh, "Science uh, 4D" because I'm going to talk to you about the fourth dimension or time. And uh, as Dean mentioned, and I should say that I'm a Waltham neighbor of Dean's. Brandeis is in Waltham, and we're about two miles apart from each other. Um, this, this story began, uh, or at least the most recent version of it, began on October 2nd when I received a phone call at 5.10 in the morning from Sweden and woke me up out of a deep sleep. As, as I'll tell you, sleep is uh, infinite, intimately connected to circadian rhythms, so being woken up at 5.10 is not a good thing, but all this turned out to be, uh, to be quite a ride since since October, and as Dean said, uh, I shared this with my Brandeis colleague, Jeff Hall, and our Rockefeller University colleague, uh, Michael Young. And they call it 510 because that's 1110 in Stockholm, and the press conference is at 1130, 
and they want to minimize the possibility that you can uh, beat them to the announcement. Um, so since it's 5.10 and, and uh, 20 minutes, there's not much chance of that. So this is also a story about basic science, and in particular, Drosophila melanogaster, or the fruit fly. And this was a dessert that some friends of ours uh, designed for us a week or so after that phone call. And it also, on the piece of chocolate there, it's a great day for the fruit fly. That's what I said at the press conference on October 2nd at Brandeis, because in some ways, the fruit fly should have shared the prize with the three of us. And a few people know um, that this is really the fifth Nobel Prize for the fruit fly. Um, th this began in 1933 with the uh, genetic pioneer T.H. Morgan. Uh, he was actually the first American to win the Nobel Prize in physiology or medicine, um, 33 years after the Alfred Nobel began this. And then there was a series of basic science prizes that have followed uh, with ours being the fifth. And uh, one of the perks of, of winning this prize was I got to be on Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. Some of you may have heard this. And, and, and th they, are, they are a formidable competition, especially Paula Poundstone, who, when I said to her that this was the fifth Nobel Prize for the fruit fly, she said, those poor things, how do they wear five medals, those heavy medals around their neck and, and still fly? And so, so, so let me tell you why this work was recognized. And, it, and it's really because we discovered, we and our colleagues, arguably we as the pioneers, discovered this important piece of physiology. Um, and, and it turned out to our good fortune that what we discovered in fruit flies turns out to be conserved all the way to humans. Uh, in other words, it's the same principles and even the same proteins, the same functions uh, in the 600 million years since fruit flies and humans have had a common ancestor. Uh, and, and I will have more to say about this. So I should, I should uh, correct something that Dean said, um, and, and that this prize is physiology or medicine. It's not physiology and medicine. And in fact, in, in our case, and, and I'll try and uh, elaborate a bit on this theme, and it's something, I think, of interest to Dassault Systems. The, the medical applications for, of circadian rhythms are mostly in the future. This is around the corner for us, but in fact, we were honored not because we, we, we discovered something um, that really ha has helped humans, but we discovered a basic physio physiological principle which I think has the promise to do this. And, and so, just to elaborate a bit on this basic science theme, this year, um, of the 10 2017 Nobel Prize winners, um, eight of those 10 uh, were Americans, um, a very high fraction, 80%, and, and um, we were all, um, let's say, senior, senior, uh, mature, mature scientists. Um, I, I'm, I'm right in the middle of that, of that group. And my colleague, Mike Young, uh, was the youngest, and Rainer Weiss, one of the physics winners, who was an MIT professor and actually my Newton neighbor, um, is 85 years old. And, and I think the point of this, and of course, someone mentioned to me, and I should say, I hope 30 years from now, there, there are women, a large, a significant number of women mixed in here, but we, we are a product of our history. And, and part of that history, and the real reason for making this slide, is that all eight of us were the product of this golden era in the United States uh, from the post-war period uh, until really very recently. And in part because of Sputnik and other reasons, we, we, we were the beneficiaries of unprecedented support for basic science. That there's been a shift. Um, I think translational work has, has become uh, more trendy, but I, I want to emphasize, and I think the introduction and what I've heard about Dassault Systems is perfectly in harmony with this. A long-term vision requires a foundation, 
And sometimes you don't know exactly what's going to come out. Certainly you don't know when, and you don't even know exactly what is going to result. And of course, all of us um, were the recipients of incredibly long-term uh, support from the National Institutes of Health, the National Science Foundation, and in my case, HHMI, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, whose philosophy, whose mantra is support people, not projects. If you support very good people, uh, they'll, they'll uh, produce for you. And I think Bell Labs is the classic example in the United States of that kind of support. So, so let me tell you a little bit about myself, uh, because, uh, because I was encouraged to follow this, this, general, um, this general outline. Um, I, I went to Caltech as an undergraduate uh, at the age of 17. Um, I did not have a completely straightforward path. Uh, many young people have said, how can I follow in your footsteps? How can I do something great like you did? And I said, first of all, don't do exactly what I did if you can avoid it. It's not necessarily the best thing to do. Um, I, I, as, uh, as Dean said, I was across the river at MIT, and, and I think what's very interesting in hindsight about these two institutions, Caltech and MIT, they're, they're, they're the epitome of meritocracies. They really don't care if, if you are unorthodox personally, as long as those behavioral issues are not too extreme. You know, if you can, if you can perform, that's what we're interested in, and, and that was fantastically um, beneficial to my path. Uh, I was a postdoc in Edinburgh in the UK. I spent two years in France uh, at various points. Um, I came to Brandeis already almost 45 years ago um, into really a different scientific world. I should say, in, in, in support of this not straightforward path, I actually didn't receive tenure in the, in the institute I was in. They asked me to leave. And the president was, um, let's say, prescient enough to keep me in the university. He made me move into the biology building, leaving that um, high-profile institute. And I, I was moved next to Jeff Hall. And Jeff Hall and I had a partnership for 20 years. I shared this prize with Jeff Hall. And so um, the glass is always half full, um, some things which don't seem very uh, positive at the moment turn out to have benefits, and my being placed next to Jeff, Jeff was an enormous advantage. And, and that, two months after I moved, we started our collaboration, and this is um, a, picture, a picture from the 80s uh, of Jeff uh, on your left and, and me uh, at an evening seminar at one of our homes. Uh, we, we are actually listening to a speaker who's talking about his research uh, in, in two of our vices from the 80s, uh, tobacco, tobacco and alcohol. So um, th this is a, uh, a quote from Sidney Brenner, one of the really great 20th century biologists, and I think it'll resonate with uh, Deso Systems. Um, S Sidney said that progress in science depends on new techniques, new discoveries, and new ideas, probably in that order. And, and what you learn from being a scientist for a long time is that most ideas turn out not to be true. Um, they're, they're, they're a dime a dozen, that's a bit of an exaggeration, but it's easy to think up clever things, and nature didn't do things the way, the way we think about them. Um, and so new techniques really advance, um, really advance uh, fields. Uh, discoveries or accidental discoveries, and of course, ideas that follow from a discovery make a lot of sense, as long as they're based uh, uh, on something. So let me tell you about circadian rhythms, uh, tell you a bit about this field and how things work. And so the, the, the oldest environmental uh, cue, what life on Earth has been exposed to for the longest time is that rotation. And that creates a cycle of light and dark and cycles of temperature in most areas of the world. And, and, and these rhythms, these inexorable circadian rhythms, arose as a consequence of that environmental exposure, which preceded 
the atmosphere with its current gaseous constitution. There was no nutrition for biological organisms, anything like what we have today, but there was that rotation of the Earth. And as a consequence, circadian rhythms exist almost in every, um, in every aspect of life. Those are cyanobacteria, a photosynthetic bacteria species on your left, which have a reporter gene which emits light, and the light uh, comes and goes with the 24-hour rhythm. That's a bean plant in the middle, and many of you have perhaps noticed that plants will, with a circadian rhythm, their leaves will drop or will extend uh, to, to minimize moisture loss at night and to maximize photosynthesis in the daytime. And, and that's a piece of human uh, mammalian tissue from the brain, which also carries a reporter gene, and that reporter also fires um, with the 24-hour rhythmicity. And so, uh, you know, of course, all of this takes place in human beings as well, and, and that's, of course, an object of attention, and I'll have a bit more to say about that. So, circadian rhythms. The circadian clock ticks away in constant darkness. It doesn't need the light-dark cycle to function, but what the light-dark cycle does is keep everything on track. So humans run with a clock of about 24 hours and 15 minutes. Every day we're about 15 minutes late, and sunlight resets our clock back to square one. So every day is the same as the day before because of that uh, relationship to the light-dark cycle and sometimes temperature. The purpose of rhythms is really anticipation. The early bird gets the worm, and the early worm avo avoids being eaten by the bird. And uh, there's also some regulation of internal events so that A happens before B, before C. Inside us, physiology, metabolism, endocrinology, um, and that's more efficient than having A, B, and C all happen at the same time. So the beginning of this story um, is really about genetics. And some pioneers at Caltech, Ron Kanopka and Seymour Benzer, isolated mutant of mutant fruit flies, mutant Drosophila, whose rhythms were bizarre. And, and, I, and I don't have time to tell you about this in more detail, but suffice it to say that those strains of fruit flies they isolated were the point of departure for this whole field. And, and I, I, I need to tell you ever so briefly about why genetics. And, and this is not to try and discriminate between nature and nurture. And it's not to try to decide if my clock runs a little faster or slower than yours or yours and your neighbor. Genetics is really an entree into an otherwise intractable problem. How do we find out what the clock consists of? What's the quartz crystal inside us that keeps time? And, and this is just unapproachable. There's no way in except really for genetics. If you have a mutant, which is weird, and you can clone that gene, then that provides a potential entree into the problem. And the last point I wrote there was just to emphasize that even the paradigm of nature and nurture, namely learning, learning should be nurture, right? That's by definition, and yet even learning rests on proteins, which of course are encoded by genes, and so genetics lies behind absolutely everything. So we cloned and identified and sequenced this period gene in the 80s, in the early days of recombinant DNA, and it turned out to be a pioneer protein. We had hoped that its sequence, the protein sequence, would tell us what it does. We say, oh look, it's glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase, or look, it's a DNA binding protein. Aha. That's, that's where we have to go. But the sequence, it was so, such early days that the database didn't have, uh, it wasn't rich enough for us to find relatives. And finally, two, 20 years after that first paper of Kanopka and Benzer, in 1990, Paul Harden, who was a postdoc in my lab, discovered that the messenger RNA from the period gene itself underwent circadian oscillations, and those oscillations were in sync with the behavioral oscillations that Kanopka and Benzer and we and everyone else in the field had subsequently measured. In other words, there was a parallel 
between the mRNA, the actual gene expression, and, and the behavior of the animal. And, and the experiments we had done suggested that the protein product from the gene was involved in a negative feedback loop and inhibited its own expression. So the protein levels go up. When they get high enough, they feed back and, and um, in, inhibit uh, their own expression. When things decay away, the whole system 24 hours later starts again. And for the engineers here, you'll appreciate that, that to not come at steady state, for an oscillator to function, you have to have special properties. You have to have a delay in the feedback loop. Otherwise, everything comes to steady state, and that's part of the detailed part of the story. And it turned out that in a very small number of years later, we and the field identified the rest of the members of this feedback loop, and it turned out that the fly system on your left that is a transcription factor which generates the negative regulators, period, and timeless, which then feed back on the positive transcription factor, have a precise orthologous set of proteins which function in mammals, including humans, exactly in the same way. So here, here we have the same system keeping time uh, in flies and mammals. And this ignores many details that, that I don't have time to tell you about. So, What's, what's of interest here? Why, do circadian, why, should, why should Dassault Systems, and many of you interested in life sciences, be, be paying attention to circadian rhythms? Uh, so um, the, the reason is because this small feedback loop, this core clock here, uh, what I've been describing as this transcriptional timekeeper, it also regulates and drives the cycling synthesis of other genes, and those other genes drive the cycling of additional genes. And in fact, one really has thousands of genes, hundreds to thousands of genes, in each cell and tissue, which are undergoing circadian oscillations under the aegis, under the control of this transcriptional feedback loop. In other words, it's directly regulating the oscillation of more genes. And in addition, this system not only works in the brain, in the master locations of timekeeping, but it operates in every tissue in the human body. That is skin, muscle, liver, spleen, everywhere. And so we all have systems of clocks in every tissue which are ticking away and, and driving transcriptional oscillations, and as a consequence of these two properties, namely the ability to drive transcription of many genes in each tissue and the large number of tissues, that more than half, maybe 70, 80, perhaps even 100% ultimately of all gene expression in humans is rhythmic. In other words, you pick a gene and in some tissue or other, the gene expression is oscillating from that particular gene. And the heat map shown here is to indicate that different transcripts peak at different times of day. And, and I will come back to that point in a, in, a, in a context, I think, that will be interesting for engineers. And so it's really for this reason that the circadian clock has its fingers in every aspect of, of human health, um, sleep, metabolism, cardiovascular disease, e even cancer, as, as I'll try and allude to. And, and the, 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 the issue of sleep, and we all know that circadian biology um, affects sleep, exemplified best by jet lag. I suspect some of your French colleagues here um, are, are suffering uh, from this if they arrived yesterday. And, and the remarkable thing is that four of these Drosophila clock genes, the genes that the field has discovered that governs circadian timing, four of those genes are intimately involved in human sleep syndromes. In other words, families have been found that have sleep difficulties in which the uh, gene responsible for the sleep difficulties, which is inherited in a simple Mendelian fashion, very simple, are the human equivalent of the clock genes that we discovered in fruit flies. So in other words, this closes the circle, if you like, from not only from fruit flies to humans, but to, to a real 
human syndrome, uh, an illness, if you will. So let, let me say a word about the future, uh, human health, computer modeling, and something uh, a little um, frivolous uh, that I think you'll find amusing of what I'll call circadian art. So, so first of all, I will simply assert that a broken or a wounded clock uh, enhances the probability that you are suffering from one of the following. And, and I won't go into great detail. I've already mentioned sleep disorders. And, and of course, as I said, jet lag is, is, a, is an example of this, of this problem. But let me say a word about metabolic diseases because I think you'll, you'll find this uh, amusing. Something as simple as time-restricted feeding, that is subjecting yourself, humans, this is done originally with mice experiments, but the data are looking quite compelling that eating for eight or 10 hours a day and then fasting, that is taking in no nutrition for 14 to 16 hours a day is really beneficial. Um, and of course, the, the notion is that this is reinforcing the natural uh, metabolic cycles that our body undergoes. Um, when we sleep, we fast, we change the source of energy in our bodies from glucose, which we take in, to glycogen, which the liver is secreting. And so undergoing feeding fasting cycles is probably really helpful to, uh, to human physiology. Uh, the the uh, data suggest currently that uh, between 20 and 30 percent of European and U.S. employees um, uh, are involved in shift work, and it's clear, um, m most prominently from a, a study on nurses, that shift work is really not good for your health, and it's very likely that this is through uh, a manipulation uh, of, of, of the circadian clock in human beings. And, and of course, what parallels this is uh, the large fraction of the world's population which is exposed to light at night. So we, we, we evolved at night to be in darkness or moonlight, not in fluorescent lighting. And so there's just no question that the way we live is having an impact on our on our circadian system, and of course, this is just something that we all um, experience or all undergo. Staying up late at night um, or blue light emitting screens, this is why Apple has introduced this orange screen, which you can activate on your device uh, at, 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 in the evening, um, that this results in, in uh, a circadian problem. So, you know, light in the daytime, best sunlight in the daytime, dark at night, that's the way we evolved. That's, that's what um, we should be experiencing. And, and, and lastly, in this general context of, of health is, is ADMA. I always forget what this refers to, absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion uh, of drugs. Chronopharmacokinetics. In other words, it's clear from the experimental data that when you give a patient, when you take your medicine, um, those of us here who take Lipitor have been advised to take it at night. That's because of circadian rhythms or chronobiology, because of how that drug is metabolized. So paying attention to when, um, when drugs are delivered, um, e e e even uh, chemotherapy should really be investigated around the clock. Of course, you can imagine how this would upset the whole industry if, if one had to go in for a treatment at 2 a.m., meaning it's the people who do the work that is, is problematic. But it's really very important that this be paid attention to. So let me say a word about modeling. And, and this is right in your wheelhouse. And of course, now I'm talking about modeling in four dimensions. Mostly you think about 3D and spatial the spatial dimension, and now I'm, I want to introduce for you the temporal domain. And, and this comes from a former postdoc of mine, uh, a professor, chairman of neuroscience at Northwestern, Ravi Alada, and his colleague, Rosemary Braun, who kindly gave me this slide, something they're doing. And, and I, I think you, you'll find it simple and of interest. So 
The current methods for assessing circadian phase involve taking time points. So if you want to look at a human and, and, and find out exactly how their circadian clock is running, you take blood samples and look at their melatonin levels at the blood in very tightly timed intervals. And of course, if circadian transcription, if almost all of gene expression uh, oscillates around the clock, and most importantly, we have different genes which peak at different times of day, then you can appreciate that if you take, took a snapshot at just one time, or in fact, in this particular paradigm, they use two time points, morning and evening, and you can identify the levels of these different transcripts with peaks at different times, you can quickly find the time, exactly the time, that corresponds to that pattern. So that means you can take one blood sample, this is done with human blood, take one blood sample, do this assay, and you know what time of day that, that, that you, have, you have done that. So this, this is a, uh, a way to diagnose uh, circadian disruption or shifts in, in people. And, and now in the last couple of minutes, I, I want to say a word about circadian art. And, and this is just for amusement's sake. But um, it turns out that Neurospora fungus has a circadian clock. It's rather similar to the clock in flies and humans. And they have genes which uh, participate in this clock and which are light sensitive. And so in fact, um, that gene expression element can be hooked up to an enzyme which produces light, luciferase, and um, if one exposes the organism to greater intensities of light, then the amount of luciferase that is produced also is increased. And of course, the, the, a picture is really just um, a map of light intensities because that's what we see. And so um, the question is, can one marry these two principles, a circadian organism carrying a gene expression element which produces light, and, and expose that a mat, a really high density map of this organism to an image? And, and, and the idea is, is just, they, they, this is from a colleague of mine in Santiago, Luis Lorando, and they call this life canvas, and they project an image onto a map of Neurospora, and then uh, the bioluminescence, which is emitted, um, is, is, can, be, can be imaged on a CCD camera. So here's, here's the picture that they're showing uh, onto the image that they're projecting onto the uh, fungal strain. And so now the, the bioluminescence is monitored every minute, and here's a time lapse picture of the, of the uh, organism um, as a function of time. And so what you can see, of course, is that the gene expression is appearing um, with time, and, and the uh, response to intensity is, is so fine that one can really see a very, uh, a, a very handsome uh, picture. And uh, you can capture that image um, with a regular camera. This is a 15-minute exposure using a, a, a standard camera. And so Luis and his colleagues um, did this with a, uh, an image, a particular picture that they projected onto, that, uh, onto the fungal mat. Uh, and the purpose of this was um, to prevent this, present this to the Pope when he, when he visited Chile um, just, just a, a few months ago that is actually uh, using this circadian organism to try to turn it uh, into art. So um, in, the, in, one, in, in a remaining minute or two, let me return to the prize and, and try and reflect a bit on, on what did I contribute to this work. So uh, I am persistent. Um, I, I do not give up easily. Um, I, I really had a team of wonderful people over the years who I'll mention, and, and, I, and, I, and I didn't get in the way of letting good people do important stuff. Um, I'm trained in nucleic acids, not as a circadian biologist, and it's really at the interface of these two fields, 
where we made progress. Nobody who worked in circadian biology really knew about nucleic acids and proteins, and, and, and I was able to um, bring this to um, the field. And of course, it's not just persistence and knowledge and all that. Um, there's also luck involved in winning a Nobel Prize. Uh, recombinant DNA came along at just the right time. This feedback loop we discovered was correct in general. It was true in humans. We didn't discover that. Other people then asked, might this be true in humans? And it was. Um, the, the, the cycling RNAs I described, the fact that much, most of the genome and of animal physiology is controlled by the clock. We, we had a little bit to do with that, but really most of that was discovered by other people. And of course, I had this incredible set of trainees and collaborators over the years. And I really ran two labs for a long time, a nucleic acid lab in which we worked on yeast, um, and, and of course, um, Rhythm uh, and the fly people who were responsible for the circadian work that I described. And, and I, I would really be negligent um, if I didn't mention what is probably the most important foundation to my success, um, which is, of course, the fact that I really have an awesome family, and here we, here we all are at uh, Stockholm. So I thank you very much for your attention, and it's been a pleasure to be here.